as of 4.15, Epic has moved the wheeled physics vehicle component into its own plugin. This gives us the ability to easily add and remove it as needed. So for people who don't need it, they can save some space inside their final built version. Traditionally, if you add a component, you go to custom, you could find the simple wheeled vehicle movement and the wheeled vehicle movement components. If you no longer wish to have them, you can go to plugins, you can go to your built-in plugins, go down to physics, and you'll find the physics vehicles plugin. Let's go ahead and uncheck it to disable it and restart. After a short while, your system will restart. It'll come back up and you'll find that anything that did use that plugin will no longer work. And you'll find once this comes back up, we no longer have access to that component. Let's restore our little car blueprint and open it up. We'll go down here to custom and we'll find they're no longer there. That's it, really simple. Epic has stated that they plan on doing this to a lot more components in the future to bring down the final build size and make things easier on its developers. The new force feedback component is now a component that is added to your blueprint and it allows you to have better control over force feedback. Prior to 4.15, you had these three nodes. You had the ability for the client to play force feedback, stop force feedback, and then also dynamic force feedback. But you'll notice these are targeting the player controller. With the newer force feedback component, which you can add, you now have these nodes. You still have your basics of playing and stopping, but now these are done on the component level itself. So what that means is rather than always being on the player, you could put a force feedback component onto something else or even add a location using the new spawn force feedback at location node and have the force feedback originate from there and be adjustable, have attenuation and intensity and be actually somewhere physically in your world rather than always on your player. This gives you more robust ability to control how your force feedback is going to work. Now in terms of our settings, we have our force feedback effect. This is something that was originally in 414 and it's still there, but now we have an attenuation option. So we have the ability to attenuate our force feedback, give it fall off, our distances, what it consists of and things like that, in addition to our force feedback effect. Now looking at our nodes, it's pretty simple. All of these will basically take in a force feedback component as your input, with the exception of the spawn version because this one spawns uniquely in the world. We have the ability to play like we could before. We have the ability to stop it. But in addition to that, basically how it's gonna work is you take your force feedback component, you can set the force feedback effect at design time, or you can set it at runtime, so you can change them as needed. You have the ability to change your multiplier directly, and then you can apply an attenuation setting to a force feedback as well, which you can see here. So for example, we could grab our force feedback component, put in a new attenuation setting, and then apply the new attenuation. Now, like I mentioned before, we do have these two nodes here that are different because these are now components. We can spawn them attached. This is basically spawning a force feedback component like we would anything else, but we can also spawn it at location. So for example, a grenade explodes somewhere. The grenade, when it hits, could spawn a force feedback at the current location, and then you could apply a simple rumble effect at that location to simulate an explosion to the player, rather than just simply having the player itself simulate something by using our older methods. The nice part about this as well is because of the attenuation and the ability to have more than one at a time, you could technically have force feedback come from multiple locations and it will affect and apply appropriately. So that's a basic rundown of the new force feedback component. It gives us better control over force feedback and allows us to put it in the world rather than just on the player. Material fast nodes are fast versions of existing nodes that were added in because the existing nodes were slightly computationally expensive. The point of the fast mode is to give you a accurate-ish result that is much, much faster than using the accurate result. For example, if you're going to use something like our cosine, 
you'll notice it says it's an inverse cosine function. It's an expensive operation. It's not reflected by the instruction count. But if we did an arc cosine fast, you'll find it says the approximate inverse cosine function. Basically, this one's going to give you back roughly the same result as this one, except this one will be much more accurate and much more computationally expensive. Now we have them for the arc cosine, the arc sine, the arc tangent two, and the arc tangent. And you'll find the fast version simply with the word fast after that. So if you need the arc nodes themselves, but you don't quite need the accuracy, maybe if it's something simple like determining the rough approxima approximation of something, or you need an approximate result for layering down a texture, go ahead and try the fast version. You'll find that it will be much faster and you might get something that's good enough because you know, something farther off in the scene, something that doesn't need the accuracy of our computationally expensive nodes. Added in version 4.15 is the ability for event tracks inside of Sequencer to have a payload, or basically to pass them data in a struct. So what does this mean? Well, here is our normal system. I hit play, we have some things happen, and it finishes. Now let's say I wanted to have an event. I could right click properties and I could, whoops, I could just simply add a key here. So let's go to here and add a key on my event track. And here's my key. We have our key properties here. We have an event name, the time, but now we have a parameter struct setting. So let's name this event something like payload event, payload event. Now by default, if we were to go into our blueprint and open it up, and we'll do something, for example, custom event, we'll call this payload event. I'm gonna steal this print string for a second, and we hit play. We should see hello when that payload fires off. I mean, that event fires off, sorry. But let's say we want to transfer some data into there. We want it to actually do something. Well, we would have a structure that could contain data. We could set the data inside of our sequencer, and then it would pass it along. So for example, let's make a new structure and we will call this the, um, I'll just call it payload event struct. We'll open it up and I want this to be pretty simple. We're just gonna put a Boolean in there and we'll put in a string. We'll do a string and we'll do a Boolean. And we'll call this one out string. And we'll call this one out bool because that's what I feel like calling it. Now, if we go back into our sequencer and we look at our event, we have a payload option. Now I can change this to our payload event structure and it's now going to have options. I can set my Boolean and my string. So this is my string. We'll go ahead and compile this and we'll run this and you'll notice something different. You'll notice when we hit play this time, we no longer have an output of the, our text. Our text is no longer there saying hello. When you add in the payload, the signature for my event has changed. It's now expecting a Boolean and a string. If we go in here, well, we only have nothing. We need to make sure our signatures match. So we're expecting a Boolean and a string. Names don't matter. You'll notice I'll keep it the same here. I'll go ahead and hit play. You'll notice it says hello now because our signature matches and it fires it off. And we can do something like this. Hello and pass in our parameter. Hit play and now our parameter will pass through and it says, this is my string. So it's a nice way to have your sequencers send data to the events inside of the event track. But keep in mind, you'll notice this one right here, the entire time was hooked up, handle payload, and never fired off because it has this for the signature. Inside my blueprint, it does not match. So that is the key when you're doing the event tracks, whatever your structure contains, Boolean string, make sure your event receives that information, a Boolean and a string, names don't need to match. And that's the basics of the payload in the events inside of Sequencer. 4.15 adds the ability to change items, possessable items to be exact, inside of Sequencer at runtime. Now, what do we mean by that? Let me run through this example. I'm gonna hit play on my Sequencer. Well, I'm gonna hit play. My Sequencer is gonna run. My camera rotates and we see this little cube rotate. And that's fine and dandy. But a sequencer basically works with fixed information, as you can see here. Here's my sequencer itself. You can see it running. And I have a cube inside of here. 
that I'm modifying. And the cube is what I'm modifying. But let's say the sequencer was something that we needed to be dynamic. For example, our cube itself gets destroyed at some point. So this animation is no longer valid. We need something else in that place. Maybe a destroyed cube. Maybe this represents an army. So this was brought up as an example. Let's say it's more like Dynasty Warriors where you have massive armies and things can change. Now your sequencer at the end of your fight should reflect how you did. You shouldn't see, for example, a sequencer with a hundred of your soldiers cheering if you've managed to only make it out with five or ten. So you need to change things out to make things more dynamic. And that's what the ability to change the bindings are and that we're going to show right here. So this is what I mean by that. If we go into our map itself, our level blueprint, we find a few different nodes. If I type in binding, we're going to find some binding nodes hooked up to our cinematic bindings. We can add, we can remove, we can reset, and we can set. In this case, I'm going to use the set. What this does is it basically takes a target, which is a sequencer we want to target, grabs a binding out of it. In this case, my binding would be this cube, because in here I have a cube and a camera. Those are my two items I can bind to. In this case, you can see I have my camera and my cube. What we want to change out. So in this case, I want to change out my cube to a sphere. I have a sphere hidden over here and I want to change it out. And then I don't want to keep anything that exists. I want this to be new. I want to replace it basically. So in this case, if I did that and I hit play, now you'll see my sphere is going. If I wanted to make this different, I could of course hide my cube. There's lots of things to do. This is an overview. This is just showing the new feature and how it works. So in terms of how it works, we have our cube and our cube is a possessable right now. It's marked as a possessable. That's why it says convert to spawnable. If I convert it to a spawnable, for example, I can convert it back to a possessable. Bindings only work on possessables. That's something to keep in mind. It's got to be something in the scene itself as part of the sequencer. Can't be something spawned in later. And how you would hook it up is you have your sequencer. In this case, I have my sequencer in my level. So I have a reference to it. You get the bindings from the sequence. In that case, you do get bindings. And you're going to go ahead and get sequence bindings. Now, by default, it has no sequence. So you have to hook one up. In this case, my sequence is called sequencer sequence. When you do that, any available possessables will show up. And then you would hook that up. In this case, it's my cube. And then you would simply add in an array of actors. Now, again, like I said, there are more than one bindings. We can reset them if at one point we want to reset it. And we can also add instead of set. So this will take the existing ones and add something additional. So maybe you want to add more things in rather than just changing completely. Now there are more details about this inside the documentation on the website, as well as possible more videos covering how to do this. But this is a basic overview of how it works to change bindings inside your sequencers at runtime. In 4.15, we see a dramatic change to our blend space editor. A blend space editor, of course, can be opened by simply opening up any of your blend spaces. For example, here's my default run blend space that comes with our third person character. And we'll notice, well, things look really different. This is our new blend space editor down here, primary window, and everything that used to be accessible from here, for example, the axis names, values, and things like that are now in your own detail panel over here, an asset detail panel. Now our axis settings can be accessed under axis settings. We can of course change them like we did before, change the name, values, number of grids, times, things like that. But we now have some more things in here such as the ability to set up our animation notifies and add in some sample interpolation and basically cleaned up and gave us more options. Now, one of the biggest changes here is if I move my mouse around my blend space, you'll notice my character is no longer animating. The previous version was a little difficult when you were trying to do things like drag and drop, where your blend space itself would react when you bounced over. Let me open up this new blend space right here, and let me go and delete all of my entries. Now we have a blank 2D blend space. I have X and Y values, speed and direction, and you can see them here, speed and direction and I have nothing in here. Now, if I want to put the idle down here, 
Previously, if you did this, you would immediately see your character reacting and you start seeing different things happen. So if I wanted to add in the walk, now all of a sudden I would see things blending automatically. And if I added the run, it made it really difficult to pinpoint where you wanted things. With the new version, this green dot represents your preview. And if you notice, it says hold shift to move. Now you have to hold shift and forcibly move your preview spot and then it will lock it in place. And one thing to note is if you're in another window and you come back, you hold down shift, it doesn't automatically pick it up. Make sure you click in your preview window here, your blend space, and then you can pick up. So again, click, hold down shift, and you can move your preview point anywhere. So for example, I could lock it here, and now I don't have to worry when I'm adjusting my run that's going to go ahead and affect my, my preview shows. You do have a couple more things in here. You have the ability to show triangulation. So for example, if I had a run point here and I had a run point here, we could turn on and off the triangulation. Before it was always turned on, now you can toggle it. You can fit your grid between stretching or just fitting it so we have a more compact look. And of course we can click on any of our values and edit them here, like before, changing our direction and speed directly and setting exact numbers like we want. All your other op options you used to have that were here are going to be over here. Your scale settings and values and things like that. Other than that, you're looking at pretty much the same thing, just a much more refined flow and an easier to use layout system for people who used to have problems when they're dragging and dropping and just clean things up. So those are basically our new changes to the editor blend space window.